in, in language, this uh, makes it really hard to, to avoid mistakes. It makes it easy to get caught up in all these, these um, memory manipulating details and um, make the mistakes somewhere in between the machine and your actual problem. So when you want to write safe code, when you actually want to work with abstractions that are suitable for, for your problem domain, and that's something where you use language tools like Haskell. But sometimes you really uh, cannot afford to make a trade off. So the, the example that I have in mind and that I'm going to tell you about now is a medical application that performs some, um, some calculations and simulations. <coughs> and the results of this are going to be used in the treatment of real patients. So um, you want to have this fast so that you don't waste a lot of time, but you don't want to make mistakes because you could end up really hurting or So um, you don't want to make a trade-off, you don't want to have both. And one solution when you want to have both performance and safety is what I like to call write C code in Haskell. So um, what do I mean by this and why is that good thing? Well, Haskell does expose all these, these details of the machine. You have a pointer type, you can perform point arithmetic, you can find and everything like that. But typically when you look at, um, at applications, then you will see when you will rarely see users of those of those primitives. But the situation is different when you look at the form libraries. Then you make use of these these, um, these primitives and these point manipulation stuff. But they hide it behind a high-level API, so that the user of the of the um, of the library doesn't have to worry about all these details. But you can get high performance um, anyway, and he does not only not have to worry about these details, but he cannot make mistakes there because they're not exposed at all to him. And um, so then you only have to prove that the library that you are constructing is correct and doesn't make any errors there. And um, if that's the case, then you want to save time. So the pattern here is that you identify some part of your program that is performance critical, then you isolate that in the library, optimize that as far as possible, but you hide all these optimizations away from the rest of the program. And then you can um, convince yourself that this library is correct because the scope of the library is much smaller than the scope of the whole program. And this is why this works. Next point, how can we make sure that these libraries that we write are actually correct? And one ally that we have here is the static type system, and a powerful ally that is, and it includes small classes of errors. For instance, if you perform point arithmetic in C, then a point is basically just a number. And you can add a number to this point, which you can also do stuff like adding two pointers makes no sense. But in Haskell you have a dedicated pointer type and you have a function that takes a point as a number and advances that pointer, but you cannot by accident just take two pointers and add or multiply or divide them or anything like that. Another thing that Haskell is particularly good at is that it allows you to write small functions. And small functions fit on a single page of your the screen and they also fit in your head so you can reason about them and, and really understand the whole function and convince yourself that it's correct. And then there's also great tooling like Quick Check, which can find corner cases that you just haven't thought about. Even if you understand the function, you might not have thought about all the corner cases, but with randomized testing, you will just um, be presented with these corner cases. But sometimes, Convincing yourself by reasoning about functions and using randomized testing is not enough. When there's other people's money or lives at stake, then you really want to prove that what you did is correct. And this is what Lincoln has to offer you. It's an Lincoln <coughs> extension of Haskell's type system that allows you to express relations between values at one time at the type level. And so Haskell itself is slowly embracing this kind of dependent types as well, but the, um, one of the benefits of using Likit Haskell is that it's very lightweight. So invoking Likit Haskell is an optional step at compile time, so you don't have to do it once you use it to your library. 
and also all the modifications that you use to your code are recognized by GHC only as comments. So when you use <coughs> Pascal to um, harden your libraries, you do not change anything in your actual code. And in particular, you do not change the API. So you can take an existing library, use Wicked Pascal to prove that it's correct, and nobody who uses the library has to do any changes in order to um, benefit from this. To fill this all with some life, I'm going to talk about the real application where we use this. And the application is um, a program for medical, um, for medical applications, for, for um, calculations and simulations of, um, of, yeah, of, of um, medical stuff and how our, um, our medications work with patients and everything like that. And um, they take a lot of time, they can take up to hours but they should be used in the treatment of real patients. So um, we don't want them to take hours. And luckily, these simulations are very minimal to parallelization because it's basically similar computations with lots of varying input. So um, what we did is to parallelize this setup with one master node that orchestrates the computation and then a whole host of slave nodes that perform the actual calculation. And then there's a lot of communication of course between the master and the slaves. There's, um, the master sends the jobs to the slaves, the slaves send the results back, and then the slave runs out of work, it helps the master to send a new work and everything. So there's a lot of communication going on in order to make this um, as efficient as possible. And the picture that you typically get when you look at the performance of such a system, so um, what's plotted here is the logarithm of the number of CPUs and the logarithm of the time that, there is, uh, that the calculation takes. Is that at first you get 1 over n speed up. So a straight line and this logarithmic plot is 1 over n. But then at some point the curve just flattens and you don't gain anything by adding more CPUs. And the reason why this happens is known as Andal's law. And the point is that not all your code can benefit from parallelization there will always be some code, some part of the code that will have to run sequentially. For instance, the master node here has to collect all the results and do something like add them up or um, do something with, with the bulk of the results and um, or all this, this communication with this all stuff that the master has to do one by one. So um, by adding more slaves, you can only speed up the part that is manual parallelization in the first place. So this will go as one over n. But then you also have a constant part, and the constant part is just the wall that you hit here. So when you want to improve the scaling behavior of such a system, then you have to identify the parts in your code that are not parallelizable and that take a significant amount of time. And in this instance, we um, realize that actually the serialization of the data, so putting the structured data that we have in our program, and turning it into just a sequence of bytes, and from a sequence of bytes back into structured data, that this was actually taking a significant amount of time. And this might sound surprising, but um, actually if you look at the scale at which we did this, it isn't that surprising, because as I said, the calculations took up two hours, so this is here the seconds that the calculation took for, for several um, different scenarios, and here we have 6,000 seconds, so basically two hours. And then in order to bring this down to an acceptable level, to minutes or even below minutes, we used sometimes 400 cores or more. And if you imagine that you have one master node that has to orchestrate 400 CPUs, then that's a lot of communication, a lot of serialization, and stuff adds up. So you will want to make this as efficient as possible, because, um, as I said, it's part of the sequential code that limits your scaling behavior. And you see, um, so these are different stages of our program, the different curves, and we managed to optimize them quite good. But um, at some point, you, 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 you will always hit a wall. And the point of improving your scaling behavior is to um, move this point where you hit a wall as far to the right as possible, so that you have the option of speeding up your calculation by just throwing more CPUs, more money at it. Now, a few words about the um, serialization that we use. As I said, serialization is just um, the act of 
turning structured data into sequences of bytes, or the other way around. And in Haskell, there are, there's quite a number of good serialization libraries, but also the design space for serialization is um, rather large. So, for instance, if you want to serialize data to store it over, over some, some period of time, then you might want to have some kind of backwards compatibility. If you make changes to your library, then you might uh, want to be able to read the data that you wrote with the previous version, or even on a different architecture, so um, stuff like byte order might matter, or you might, might want to read it with a library in a different language. So there's lots of choices to be made. You might have data that doesn't fit into your memory and want to serialize that at some, somehow, so you have to um, do some sort of streaming. You might want to have the library easy to use, or, or and you might want it to be fast. And um, since speed was the major concern for this, we uh, wrote a new library, it's called Store, and it's a serialization library that is designed with um, speed as the overmost um, design goal. So it was um, made for this program, for this distributed computation. And the typical data that we need to, um, to serialize are just vectors of numerical data. So, um, like vectors of doubles or something like that. And the data fits into memory because we have to do calculations with it. It's, it's, it's not, not too large, so we don't have to do any, um, any incremental serialization or backtracking in the decoding. We don't need any versioning. We can move to a fixed architecture because we have total control over the cluster that we set up, so we can just choose an architecture and stick with that. We don't need a versioning scheme. We don't need partial deserialization and backtracking. And this allowed us to get really fast for this particular use case. Now there's one problem with that, because as I said, we, we don't do incremental serialization or deserialization, but we use uh, strict byte strings. And that's very efficient because we only have to allocate a block of bytes once and not multiple times. However, when we uh, want to do this, um, this distributed computation, then we will have a network layer in between, and then the data will arrive in chunks that don't need to be the same as what we, what we sent on the other end. So we need some kind of streaming layer that can accept these chunks that arrive over the socket, and um, accumulate them, and give us back a whole message. And for this, we added a thin streaming layer on top of the serialization layer, but on top of the serialization library, and this layer is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk. So how does it work? In order to um, be able to identify a whole message in this, this stream of incoming bytes, we prefix it by the length of the message, which is just a number of bit size, and then um, after the length comes the message itself. And then we need some buffering mechanism. So buffer with it supports two, two um, methods. One is that we have a buffer and a stream of bytes and just copy the bytes to the buffer. And the other one is to read some number of bytes from the buffer. So we have a buffer, we specify the number of bytes that we want to read, and then we either get this number of bytes or we get a number back that tells us the buffer is not uh, large, there aren't enough bytes in the buffer at this moment, so uh, we need more bytes and come back after this later. How do we implement this? Well, first of all, we need a pointer to some memory region. So we see this goes to the, to the low level stuff. We need a pointer to a memory region. And we note its size as an int. As we fill this buffer, we will, um, it will contain some number of bytes. So we write this down as well in the data type. And then when we, um, when we uh, um, read bytes from the buffer, we will just um, mark them in the beginning here as already consumed and keep track of this number as well. We could also, when we uh, consume bytes from the, from the beginning of the buffer, just move the bytes that are not read yet to the beginning, but we want to delay this until we really have to, because um, otherwise we would have um, movements of bytes a lot of times, and this is something that will cost us time, and we don't want that. 
So we just um, keep the bytes that we don't uh, need anymore, but we mark them as already consumed. Now, these are the operations that we can do with a byte buffer. First of all, we can read from the byte buffer. So this is the byte buffer. And then we give it a number that um, indicates how many bytes we want to read. And I just um, um, visualize this here as an empty rectangle. And there's two situations that we can have. Either the byte buffer contains enough bytes to give us, then it will just um, return these bytes and mark them as red here. Or it will not have enough bytes that, bytes that have not been read yet. And in that case, it will leave the buffer as it is and just return out a number that indicates how many bytes it still needs in order to give us the bytes that we asked for. When writing to the buffer, we also have different situations. One is that the buffer has enough room to accommodate the bytes that we give to it, and then we just copy the bytes. <coughs> the second is that the buffer is full at the moment. What we do it in this situation is that we know these bytes that are marked as consumed, we can discard them, and we do this by just moving these bytes to the front. And then after that, if we have enough space, we can copy these bytes to the buffer as well. Now, but there's a third situation where the buffer might be full, but we don't have any bytes that we can discard yet. And in this case, what we do is that we enlarge the buffer. So we reserve more memory for the buffer. It just grows. So these are the operations that we want to do with our buffer, and with these operations, we can implement this feeling layer. Now, what can go wrong with this? Um, first of all, when we read bytes, when we write bytes to buffer, it might happen that the buffer is not large enough and we don't notice that. And in this case, we try to write beyond the beyond what we allocated. And in the best case, if we're lucky, we'll get a segmentation for it before it crashes. Because the operating system tells us, this is not your memory, you have no business of writing to it. However, if this memory here, that follows the, the allocated memory, belongs to our program, then it can also happen that we just write some data to it. And we can corrupt any data anywhere in our program. And that's something that's, that's um, even, in, in most cases, that's even worse than a sec for because you can just get wrong results. And when the wrong results means harm to real people. The other thing that can happen is that we try to read more bytes from buffer than we have copied to it. And also here we have different failure models. One is well, that the buffer is large enough, but it's um, not filled with enough data. Then we can get just random data back. And again, random data means arbitrary result, means harm to patients. The other case is that the buffer um, is just not large enough to give us enough data. And then we try to read again from the memory that, is, that we're not supposed to read from. And if we're lucky, this belongs to someone else and we're killed. And if we're unlucky, it belongs to the same program. We get arbitrary data and someone else gets killed. So um, we want to prove that this cannot happen. <coughs> and we'll do this um, using the process. So how does the Haskell work? Is this, is this readable? Mm -hmm. this? <laughs> no, not really. It's bad. Um, Oh, can we take it? Maybe we can do the bytes. Don't I just get you. Ah. Huh? <coughs> okay. That's better. Okay. Okay. Now, as I said, um, has Haskell uses the concept known as refinement types. And that is you take a Haskell data type and restrict the values that can inhibit this type. <coughs> if you want to have a type that has ints but only ints that are non-negative, you can define a Haskell type, net, that's just an int, and then you make a special comment that's formatted to this at symbol, and then you say the type net is a value of type int with a restriction that this value should not be smaller than zero. And if you do this and then run Likert Haskell over your program, then Likert Haskell will check every 
construction of type net and will check if it is possible that there is a number involved that's, uh, that is negative. You can also define measures on your data type, such as the length for a list, and then you can use that at the, at the type level, at the liquid test level. So for instance, the measure length for a list is defined as zero for the empty list, or one plus the rest of the length of, for plus one plus the length of the list with the header removed otherwise. So with this you can access the length of the list in these refinements. And that's quite useful, for instance, if you want to have the head function which gives you, which gives you the first element of the list, you don't want to uh, call this on, a, uh, on an empty list because that will give you an exception. But what you can do is that you can refine the type of the function and basically um, make a post condition that says head is a function that goes from something that is a list of A with a restriction that the length of this list is larger than or equal to 1 to an A. And then with this again, Liquid has to check that you don't call this on an empty list. And also for tail, you can uh, refine the type and say tail is something that takes a list, and the resulting list is not longer than the original list. You might have the same list because it might have been empty in the first place, and then you will get an empty list, but um, it will not be long. It will not be long. Right. So, also when you actually run this, it's, it's, as I said, it's a separate executable and it uses GHC to pass the code and to transform it into code. And then it um, uses the, the annotations that you, you wrote as comments that are ignored by GHC. And then um, it uses an external program to solve these, these logical constraints and to try to prove that, um, that the restrictions are consistent. And then, if you send everything correctly, Into the source code. Into the original source code. It's not in the source code. No, it's in there. You write them into your source code, but they're ignored by GHC. Then the restrictions that are in your comments are actually restrictions that you would like to satisfy. Yes. Yes. So why don't you just use the types that you really want? Sorry? Why don't you just write in the types that you really want? Ah, because um, so has to, it's 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 because the the type system is not powerful enough. So, oh, I mean, you, you could extend it, but then. So what I'm saying is, what you're doing is you're actually making your type. So to me, it looks like maybe what you want to do is create a functional type that creates the proper type. It takes as an argument the expression that specifies the description. So that would be then you don't have to write all this. Yeah, if I had full flesh dependent types, then I could use that as well. I'm just kind of just getting what's the Okay. Okay. Uh, Maybe let's let's see the, the concrete examples, the more involved examples, and we'll see how this is useful and how you can express things more easily that you could somehow also try to express by using more esoteric extensions of the type system, but without changing the actual types, which has the advantage of not changing the API of the library. So, um, yeah. So as I said, in the end, you'll hopefully get the results that you can see. Now, how can we use this um, in order to harden our, our, um, our streaming player, our white buffer? Well, if I write it down like this, I have a pointer and I have three numbers. But I don't have a guarantee that actually these numbers fit the picture that I have here. So what I would like to do is to enforce that this picture is correct. That the size, that this here just the number, is actually the size of the pointer. And that the number of contained bytes is somewhere in between 0 and the length of the buffer. And the number of consumed bytes should also not exceed the number of contained bytes. How do I do this? Well, I use these refined types. I have the size as a natural number. I have the pointer here as a pointer with a restriction that the PLAN, which is a measure that is defined for pointers, 
that gives you the size of the allocated memory, that the plan of this pointer should be exactly the size that we want to see. So with this, I'm guaranteed that the pointer, that the size of the pointer and the size that is noted here will always be the same. And then for the number of contained bytes, they should not exceed the size. And the number of consumed bytes, they should never exceed the number of contained bytes. And if I write down this, um, this annotation here, then Mika Haskell will check every construction of a byte buffer to see if this is if all these constraints are changed. Let's look at the construction of a byte buffer. Um, so the function u takes maybe the size of the, of the buffer that it should construct and returns the buffer. What it does is that it um, first looks at this maybe value and says, OK, if it's given, then I use that. If not, I use the default value. And then I allocate a number of bytes given by the, by the size that I want to have. And then after that, I write this point to the byte buffer, note the size, and the contained bytes are zero in the beginning, the consumed bytes are zero in the beginning. And then I have to know that this function malloc bytes takes a non-negative number and gives me a pointer that has the correct length. And with this, everything should be fine, right? Well, it's not fine, it's not fine yet. Nick Haskell tells me that there's something wrong in my logic at this point, and it points me to the, to the section of my code where something went wrong, and also tells me what went wrong. So something went wrong, went wrong in this allocation here, and the thing that went wrong is that this integer was supposed to be of type a number that's non-negative, but it was only of type a number that's just an arbitrary number. And the thing that went wrong here is that, of course, somebody who calls this uh, new function can give it a negative number to request a byte of negative size, which makes no sense. And um, in this case, something that we have to preclude. So we can preclude this, for instance, by not just taking the number that we get, but by taking the maximum of zero in that number. And if we do that, then we actually have the result that everything is fine. Next, the next thing that we uh, want to do is reading from byte buffer, and this is something where actually things could go wrong if we read beyond beyond the limit of the byte buffer or from the real issue where there's not enough data in the byte buffer. So we want to get this correct as well. So um, we write down first of all the the, um, the restrictions for the function itself. It gets a byte buffer <coughs> and it gets a non-negative number that tells us how many bytes we want to read. And then it returns either a number that tells us how many bytes are missing in the buffer in order to return these bytes, or it gives us a pointer, and this pointer should have at least the size of the bytes that we requested. Now, um, the byte buffer, actually, I didn't say this, but it was on the slide. It's, it's an, it's an I.O. rec to, um, to this record here that we just have, so we have to unpack it from that in order not to always have to return the byte buffer, the modified byte buffer along with the results to use a useful reference. And then we calculate the number of available bytes, the number of bytes that have been copied to the buffer, minus the bytes that have already been consumed. And then if this number is too small, if it's not large enough for us to return in bytes, then we just return the difference. And if it is large enough, then we modify our byte buffer. We say, OK, now we have consumed the number of bytes that we had previously consumed plus this number n. And we return a pointer that is given by the pointer to the beginning of the buffer plus the number of bytes that had been consumed previously. And then the Haskell can actually prove a few things. One is that this pointer actually has the correct length that it has at least the length of n, so that it's not, not too short. And you can do this because at this point we know that n is um, not smaller than the number, that uh, the available number of available bytes is not smaller than n. So um, the number of available bytes is the number of contained bytes minus the 
consumed bytes. So this pointer here, cluster consumed bytes, is actually the um, number of contained bytes. And um, that's much smaller than So this, this uh, gives us a point of different size. And the second thing is that this is a correct byte buffer. And for this, um, it just has to check, I mean, we don't change the pointer, so and we don't change, change the length, and we don't change the number of contained bytes. But we change the number of consumed bytes, and it has to check that the new number of consumed bytes is still not larger than the number of contained bytes. And this, of course, we see that the available bytes is just a difference between those two, and the available bytes is not small than n. So we can add n to this, and still be below the number of and um, yeah, so Big Tesla does this check and tell, uh, tells us that actually the specification for the function works and the byte buffer that we construct is a valid byte buffer that satisfies all the, the assumptions. Now, writing to a byte buffer, then we have to um, look at these three cases that we could have. Um, so we um, write uh, bytes from a byte string to a byte buffer. So we first have to deconstruct this byte string to um, basically a pointer and the size of data contained in the byte, in the byte string. And then we can con compute the number of available bytes that are in the, in, the, um, in the byte buffer. And then we look if the number of bytes that we want to copy plus the number of available bytes is smaller than the actual size of the byte buffer. Because in this case, we have to enlarge the byte buffer. Because even when we drop the bytes that have already been consumed, if the number of bytes that we still need to keep in the byte buffer, plus the number of bytes that we want to copy to it, is larger than the size, then we have to resize it. Afterwards, if it's just currently too full, we have to check. So if the, the size of the data that we want to copy plus the number of contained bytes is larger than the size, then we can just reset the buffer because uh, the number of contained bytes is the number of available bytes plus the number of consumed bytes, and we can get rid of all the bytes that have already consumed. So we rewind the buffer in this case. And at this point, we know that we have enough, enough room in the buffer, and we can actually start copying the bytes with a copy bytes function to this, uh, this pointer of the buffer that has been modified, and um, plus the number of bytes that are not in this buffer. And we copy from byte string, we copy the number of bytes that are in this byte string. And then we can um, construct a new byte buffer by saying okay, the size is the size that we got after after resizing basically, if we need to resize the number of contained bytes is the number that was contained previously plus the number that we copied. The number of consumed bytes hasn't changed and the pointer is the byte of the Now in order um, I mean if resizing and rewinding actually works, then then it's clear that this that this works and that we will not get a buffer over this. Um, but the thing that we have to make and that we have to dive into Tesla to to prove to us is that these operations of enlarging the byte buffer or resetting the byte buffer actually do what we think that they do. And um, we can do this by writing down specifications. So, for instance, enlarging byte buffer should take byte buffer off reference to byte buffer and um, it should take the number that we will want the, the byte buffer or that we oh, we give it the number of bytes that we will want the byte buffer to be able to hold afterwards. So we say grow it to a size that is at least as large as this. And then we want to have a byte buffer after this where the size is at least that number. The number of contained bytes should not have changed, and the number of consumed bytes should not have changed either, because we just want to resize it. We don't want to do anything else. So in order to do this, 
we have to first construct the number that is at least as large as the number that we want here. I mean, in principle, we could just set the size of the new byte buffer to, this, to the size that we're given, but then we can run into some worst case scenario where the messages that arrive are, um, are growing larger and larger. And then we will continuously um, enlarge our byte buffer in order to contain all these growing messages. And so we would spend a lot of time copying. And um, what we do instead is that we just um, basically enlarge the byte buffer by a factor of 1.5 every time it's too small. And then uh, we get a, an exponential growth of the, of the buffer until the point that we want it to grow. And so we don't have this, this uh, we, don't, we cannot run into this case where just the messages are 10 bytes, 11 bytes, 12 bytes, 13 bytes, and then um, we have to grow. So with this we get a, we get a new size that is, um, that must be larger than this number that we had here. And um, then notice that here, by, by, when we multiply the, the number of the, the, the length of the, of the of the old buffer, we again take a maximum of one at the length, because otherwise we could have a buffer of size zero, and if we multiply the size by a factor, then we stay at zero. So this makes one S makes sure that we can get uh, larger than the number that we got here. Then we allocate a new pointer by using this reallocation of bytes. And um, yeah, we allocate a pointer of the new size and return byte buffer reference that has the new size, the new pointer, and doesn't change the contained bytes, the zoom bytes. And in order for uh, to prove to us that this does what we want it to do, we have to tell it that has to get that real bytes, gets a pointer, and a one the number and then returns a pointer that has a length that corresponds to this number. And with this, it's true that this pointer has this number because it's just the number that we gave it here. It's also true that um, the size of the new byte buffer is at least as large as this number here because um, Nikit Haskell can prove that this, um, basically from this branch here, it, um, it only returns when the size is larger than the number that we started with. And then the number that we wanted, we wanted to exceed. And so this it has to prove that this enlarging byte buffer actually works and does what we want it to do. The next thing that we want to do is rewind the byte buffer. And we give this byte buffer. And we expect to get a byte buffer that has zero consumed bytes. So the consumed bytes are discarded. The number of bytes that are contained are the number of bytes that had been contained there previously, minus the number of already consumed bytes, and the size did not change. And we do this by once again calculating the number of available bytes, moving the bytes to the pointer of the byte buffer itself, from the pointer plus the number of bytes that have already been consumed, and we move the number of available bytes. And with this specification of move bytes, that, you know, we get a pointer and another pointer, and a number that should not be larger than um, any of those two pointers. Um, Link test can actually prove that the number of available bytes does not exceed any of these, of these, uh, number, of these uh, pointer lengths. So this move operation is safe. We don't have a, a, um, a buffer overflow here. And you can also prove to us that the byte buffer that we get is a byte buffer that, that um, really corresponds to our specification and to the requirements that we provide above. And with this, it can also prove to us that the action of adding some bytes to a byte buffer, where it may have to resize or enlarge the byte buffer, is also correct. That's what we want. So, with this, let me conclude. The main point of this talk is that you don't have to compromise, you don't have to make a choice between safety and performance, but you can add both. And um, you can do this by writing C in Haskell, by identifying the performance critical parts, using these low level, low level primitives there to get highly optimized code, hiding this well behind the Hydra API, 
and then disseminating the library and proving that there are no mistakes in there. And the tool that I uh, used for this is the Tester, which can prove invariants for your code, for, for um, invariants of your code that have to be satisfied at runtime, at compile time. And yeah, the, 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 the benefits are that you don't have to change your code, you only just have to add these comments, or you probably have to change it. It wasn't correct in the first place. It doesn't have any runtime overhead, and the compile time overhead is optional, and you don't need to change the time code you don't, because you don't change anything in the actual code. Thanks. So presumably, the first version of your code didn't immediately pass. Yeah. Right? How, how good are Liquid Haskell's error messages in that case? Do they help you fix the um, problems? Well, the error messages, um, I mean, when you start with Liquid Haskell, then they can be a bit overwhelming. But right. um, they are actually, when, when you get used to the syntax and everything, then they are rather succinct. So this is an example from an error message where I forgot um, to make sure that this number is non-negative. And it tells you where the error occurred with the line number and the actual line, underlining also the, the part of the expression where things went wrong. And then it tells you the context, where stuff went wrong, what it tried to, to get, and what it actually got. And this instance, it tried to get a number with a restriction that it's not negative, and it only got a number with a restriction that it's just this value. So, so that's a typical error message. It's that's not, it's not message, just yeah. for demo but purposes. If there's, if there's more wrong with your code, then the error messages can get more involved because it, it also tells you all the all the stuff that it has available, and so it can be. But, but basically, it, it just it, it just tells you what your mistake is, and um, it, it tells you <laughs> what it wants to prove, <laughs> and then you have to see. Okay, yeah, there, there's a mismatch there, and I have to make sure that uh, I change my code or my assumptions or what I actually can get in order to make the house. Sorry? Could you find stuff before being a bit greater than zero? So why do you write maybe it? Ah, uh, maybe not. This, this, I could, this, this, would be in, this would be possible. So then I would write a little bit. Uh, so, um, there would, yeah, that would be possible as well. I could use the nut tab there, and then Liquid Haskell would check within the library, because that's what it checks, that it's not called with a negative argument. But if I have client code that calls this with a negative argument and doesn't use Liquid Haskell to check that everything is correct, then I could still call, um, get, call it with a negative argument, and with the code as it is now, I would run into problems. I, don't, I actually don't know what problem I would get because I don't know what, what C would do if I had a man with a negative argument. But and this is why I changed it to this. Yeah. Yeah. You can propagate it, but if you, if you want the library to be just um, consistent and safe to use without the client code needing to use the desktop as well, then I'd say this is the better choice because you, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you Time, but it proves statically. No, 
I understand if there's a did in this, it will yeah. always do that. But that condition might fail at uh, one point too. It could be. But only if there's a, there's somewhere in my code there has to be an implementation of the function where I cannot prove that the that the precondition is not satisfied.
just produce white buffer spill stuff in it, and then the same stage just treat the buffer to pass it. Yeah, the point is we, we only want to have one one of those buffers because creating a new buffer that, that, would, that would always be an allocation. We want to avoid allocations. So we want to have one buffer that's mutable and then the socket writes to it and some other attachments. 